Hello, it's Keith here, and this is Lesson 13 of the Photon Series for my Z80 programming tutorials. This is, I think, the last episode of the Z80 Photon Series, although we'll be moving to the 6502 and 68000. And we got a bit of a special entry in the form of the Game Boy and also the Game Boy Color. They're basically the same system. So the game is indeed, I believe, working here. You can see it. You can see the Game Boy Color version working in a little animated GIF over there. And this is the Game Boy version running on an emulator. So, um, yeah, I think the game works exactly the same as on all the other systems, which is uh, quite fantastic, really. Now, there's two reasons why um, making this work was a little bit of a challenge. The first is, of course, the Game Boy is a tile sprite-based system, not a bitmap-based system, so I had to simulate the pixel plotting routines using tiles and sprites, but we've managed to do it. And also, the other problem was, of course, that the Game Boy isn't a true Z80, and this is especially bad for this program, because I made a lot of use of the IX and IY registers. I was using them a lot for extra registers. So we've had to compensate, we've used some um, code and some macros and things to simulate all the missing commands, which is a bit of fun. Now, if you want to know how to do that kind of thing, first you can download my source files, which has all the macros and uh, the scripts I used. And also I did do a, an episode where I discussed in the advanced series the um, simulation of missing commands. So you can take a look at that if you need some hints on that kind of how to do that kind of thing. Anyway, let's go over to the source code and let's start having a look at what goes on to make this game work. Okay. So here is the source code, this is GB Photon, and also there is a new version of the multi-platform code which is called multi-platform GB here. Now um, basically there's a lot of um, changes to cope with all the missing commands, and so rather than sort of overcomplicate the um, regular version, I've made an alternate version here. You can see there's um, the ZLDIX command which simulates the IX register and um, things like that. There's loads of them all over the place. Now uh, you, you could still in theory compile this for the regular Z80, you just need to have equivalent versions of those macros to compile to the real commands and um, I have done that in the past. But um, as I say, this version I'm using just for this version because it for the Game Boy version because it's easier to have two versions of a finished game rather than worry about whether this still really compiles for the real Z80 because the, the game's finished, I'm not changing it again anyway. Okay, so we're going to go over the code as with the other systems and discuss all the parts that make it tick, specifically the graphics parts. We're going to skip over the joystick. If you want to know how joystick reading works, take a look at YQuest or the Simple Series because it's all the same as in that series. So this system, uh, as we're treating it, is a four-color system. Now the Game Boy um, can have um, this, the Game Boy Color can have more colors on the screen, but we need the pixels to all be unique in a single tile. And so for simplicity, I'm just using four colors. We could have done something with some kind of palette swapping for tiles, but it, it's beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do here. So we're just using four colors. So color four here uh, is replaced with one. Um, color zero is considered a color here. That's why the four, color four is actually color 5 if you want to think of it like that. And then we're defining the screen size 160 by 144 and we're defining the RAM for the game variables as about 256 bytes of game variables. The same as always. Now um, the, there's a tricky problem with the um, Game Boy. Um, basically um, the Game Boy is a tile based system and the Game Boy Color has up to 512 tiles on the screen. The original Game Boy only had 256 and this is a bit of a problem for us because that's not enough tiles to fill the screen but there's a trick. There is a trick that we can do to get around it. You see the um, 256 tiles point to a specific memory address in VRAM and you can alter that memory address so you can point to one of two possible memory addresses and so by pointing to the first possible tile address at the start of the screen and then waiting till we get about two thirds of the way down and switching to the second one, we can actually increase the number of on-screen tiles and we have to switch back to the first one at the start of the screen and switch to the second one at the redraw. It's very much like the MSX1 can do with its three tile strips. Um, in this case, we're only using two, but the, as I say, this is actually allowing us to have every single tile unique on the original Game Boy. As I say, you wouldn't need to do this on the Game Boy Color, but it's far better to have one piece of code that works on both and so this way of doing things is allowed me to do that and um, I've covered this before I did an episode um, where I showed the Chibi Akamas title screen full screen on a Game Boy it's the same code basically just um, just making it do a lot more this time I was a bit worried it might not work right but it did so um, well done for me there we go okay so we're gonna have a look at the code here you can see the start of the cartridge header here we've got the V blank interrupt handle which sets the first pattern map address here which is the first set of tile patterns and then we've got the LCD stat interrupt handler which is the second one and the LCD stat is a specific line that we need to change at so that's the second one and switching to the second um, set of tile patterns 
usual stuff here for initialization. I'm not going to go over this again. Setting up the tile map, setting up the palettes, turning the screen off because we can't write to VRAM outside of VBlank, and that's a problem. And we, I've come up with a new idea to get around that problem. So we're going to discuss that soon. Now, um, the tile map is basically just set to consecutive tile numbers. So um, basically, um, all of the pixel plotting we're doing, we're actually not changing the tiles that are visible on the screen. We're changing the patterns of those tiles. So we, all of the blank areas are using different tiles. And this um, this is fine for this game, but in some cases that might not be a good idea. I had a look at the um, Elite game on the Game Boy, and that was actually um, redrawing the entire tile map. And it was doing that so it could use the other tiles for bits of the heads up display and things. So they, they were doing things very differently to the way I'm doing things. But as I say, this is the way I'm choosing to do it. Right. So we're going to basically use the first bank of tiles from memory address 8000 onwards. And we're going to use 240 tiles there. And that's from line 0 to 95. And then at line 96, we're going to have this interrupt switch to the second bank. And we're going to start filling those tiles from 0 up to number 119 in the second bank at 8800 in hexadecimal. So that's filling our screen with tiles. And then the rest of the code is going to be about dealing with those tiles and things. So um, uh, we, we're setting it at line 95, which is for 96 to switch to the second tile. We need to write that to FF45. Uh, we need to um, turn that on. We're doing, turning that on just here. And we're enabling it with this bit here as well. We have to do all of these different bits to get that LYC interrupt to occur. Um, and that will do the work for us. And here we're clearing the game memory just to reset everything for the new game and then we're showing the main menu but first before we go into the code it's not really changed since last time but first before we go into the code I think it's more important that we have a look at these interrupts and see how they work because they are really the crux of how this is going to work. So here is the vblank interrupt handler now to do this basically to set the memory address to memory address 8000 we're having to set bit 4 of memory address FF40 and we're doing that just there that's setting the first bank of tile patterns and then the LCD stat one, which will happen uh, around halfway down the screen, two thirds of the way down the screen, we are resetting bit four of the same address. And that's it. That, that's all that our interrupt handlers are doing. And that's allowing all of the tiles to be unique. And then, of course, all we need to do now is when we want to plot a pixel, work out which bank we need to change for the correct pixel. And we'll see that later on. OK, so that's all we're doing there. And then we'll just go through the rest of the main loop now. So here's the main loop of the game code. It's the same as every other time you've seen it. But if you've not seen the other ones, I will tell you briefly now. So um, basically, the game only updates every other tick. Unless boost mode is on, you hold down fire and the player moves faster. So here we're just incrementing the ticks. Here we are checking if boost is on. If boost is off, then we set the delay to 350. And if boost is on, we set it to 1. And the reason for that is updating the boost counter is a little bit slow because it's done with vector fonts and they're not very fast. But they are very compatible because all I need to do is update the preset and point commands and the game works on a new system. It's very easy, which is why I'm able to do so many tutorials. OK, so here what we're doing here is we're setting the initial um, value of D. D is going to be the joystick input. We read in from the joystick and see if anything's pressed down. If nothing's pressed down, we're clearing the key timeout. We're doing that just here. Now, basically, um, if I hold down the right key here, you'll see I turned once. But if I kept turning, I'd immediately crash into myself. So rather than that, we have to press, release, press, release, press, release. And that's how we turn around. So that's the way that it works. And that's why we're clearing the timeout here. We're repeating this loop until the time has occurred, the delay, and then we're actually checking the key presses. We check if the key timeout is still set. If it is, we're ignoring key presses and we skip over the next part. If it's not set, first thing we do is clear boost by setting it to one, and that disables the accelerated movement of the player. Next, we're setting HL and the virtual IX, there's no real IX register, and we're setting HL to the player direction and IX to the acceleration. And this is for the set player direction function to work. If left is pressed, we decrease the player direction in HL. If right is pressed, we increase it. And then we run set player direction, which will calculate the new accelerations using that IX pointer there. If the fire button is pressed, we check if there's any boost power left. And if there's not, then we skip over. But if there is, we set boost to zero, which turns boost on. Now, the actual um, acceleration and all the player logic and things is done by handle player, and all the CPU stuff is done by handle CPU. This is just the stuff relating to key input. The rest is all multi-platform, which is another reason I can make this game ported very quickly to other systems and why so much of it's so the same as a Quest actually. OK, so here's our interrupt handlers again. We've already discussed these. Here's a PSET routine, but this is actually just a copy of the main one, which is just here. Now, 
P set. How do we do this? Well, the um, Game Boy, of course, works in bit planes. And what this means is we have to change two bytes for each pixel for the four possible colors. Um, we have to change one particular bit in that byte, though, depending on which of the eight pixels contained with that byte we want to change. So we've got a pixel mask here, which has a byte representing each potential pixel. And the bottom three bits of our X address will be the correct offset. And that is selecting the correct pixel that we would want to change. So that's what we're doing here. We're just calculating which one to use. We're storing the pixel change value in D. That's how we will change the pixel. And we're storing a mask in E by flipping all the bits with CPL. And that's the bits that we want to keep of any byte that's already there. We're then using this calc VRAM address function, which is going to calculate the address within the pattern definitions for the tile that contains the pixel that we want to change relative to the screen position. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Then we're doing this LCD wait read command here. We're doing this twice for the two bytes, and this is going to read in the current byte, and there's a trick to this. The problem is we can't read in or write to VRAM except in V blank or H blank. H blank is very, very small and V blank is quite long, but it doesn't happen very often. So we're going to discuss the trick that this write read and this wait write are doing to get around that problem in just a moment. So this is reading in the current byte. We're then masking it with C, which is what originally was um, E here. And that is the mask for the pixels we want to keep of the background. And then we're checking the color we want to set, D, to see if the bit needs to be set. And if it does, we're awing the bit in. And we're awing in the value that we read in from here. And that's setting the first bit plane of this, uh, this byte here. We're then doing the second one in the same method here. We're just doing this second P set here. And that's the two bit planes for the pixel. And that will now be set to the color we want. And again, using LCD weight read to read the byte and write to write the new one back. The point command is basically the same. We're using the calc VRAM address to calculate the byte in the tile of the pixel we want to change. This time we're just reading it in and converting it back to a color though. So that's how we're reading in the pixel to see if the player or the enemy has collided. So all of the work of course is being done by really calc VRAM address and this is calculating the tile number that we want to change. Now the X position, less the bottom three bits, because that's the pixel within a byte of the tile. So we want to skip those ones. And we need to multiply that by eight by two. And the reason for that is there are eight lines per tile and there are two bytes per tile. And so the memory in VRAM will go down the first tile and then move along to the second one. So we need to multiply by that to work out which horizontal tile we want to actually change. So that's going on there. The base of the first set of patterns is a hexadecimal 8000. So we're going to add that in here. And then we're calculating from the bottom three bits of the Y position, the line within the tile we want to change. Now, of course, there's two bytes per line, two bit planes. So we're multiplying the bottom three bits of Y by two here. We're then taking the remainder here and we want to multiply that by 20 because there's 20 tiles wide times eight because there's eight lines per tile times two because there's two bit planes per line. I know it's a bit tricky, but you can just take my word for it if you want. Now, multiplying by 20 is a bit tricky. Uh, we can't really do that with bit shifting um, directly and we've got no multiply command. Um, so the faster thing to do is um, bit shift it until it's the equivalent of times 16. Add that in and then bit shift it again until it's the equivalent of times four and add that in again. So that's now the equivalent of times 20. So that's what we're doing there. Now that has in theory calculated the offset within a tile map. Now the only problem is um, at line 96, we need to switch to the second tile map, which is in a slightly different memory address and there's a gap between the two. And that's what we're doing here. So we're loading in the Y line. We're checking if it's below 96 and if it is, then we're returning. If it's not, then we need to skip 16 tiles. And coincidentally, we can do that just by incrementing H here, which is equivalent of adding 16 tiles, 16 times eight times two here, which is 256 bytes. So that is skipping over the uh, little gap between the two sets of patterns. And there we go, that's, that's what we need to do. Um, not too bad, really. So that's the calc VRAM address function. Um, the more tricky bit in some ways was the LCD weight read and the LCD weight write. Now, of course, we can just read and write to VRAM to do the actual reading and writing. It's actually part of the normal addressable um, range for the GBZ80 processor. Now, um, the problem is that if we try and do this outside of um, V blank or H blank, it's not going to happen. It'll just get ignored. 
Um, and so if you try this with um, nothing, without doing any kind of waiting, uh, what you end up with is pixels missing and occasionally the game will flake out and the player will um, fly through walls and things because the, uh, the detection didn't work because it didn't really, really read in a byte. Um, that's not very good. The alternative is you wait for V-blank every time and the game's horrendously slow. So I've come up with a rather um, dirty trick to get around this problem. Now, what I'm doing is I'm doing the same as before in the previous examples. We are waiting to see if we are currently able to write to RAM and we can test this with bit one of memory address FF41. If this is returning a non-zero, then we are not able to write. So we're just gonna wait until it is. And then what we're going to do with the write command is we're going to write our byte. Now, the problem is that if that test occurred right at the end of a H or a V blank, uh, maybe now what, by the time we're writing the byte, it's too late and the V blank has ended or the H blank has ended, uh, which will mean it won't occur. So what I'm doing is then I'm immediately checking again. And if we're no longer in H or V blank, uh, then I'm going right back to the top and trying the whole thing again. And I'm going to keep trying until that byte gets written. And that's the dirty trick I've come up with, which seems to work. So there we go. So yeah, basically, uh, see if we're currently in V blank. If we're not, wait until we are. Uh, if we are, then we write the byte, and then we check if we are still in H or V blank. And if we're not, we just keep trying until it happens. So forcing it through there. And the read is exactly the same. And instead of writing to VRAM, we're just reading from VRAM. But again, if we're outside of H or V blank, it will fail. So there we go. That's how I've done it. I mean, it's a bit of a dirty trick, but it worked quite nicely. A uh, clear screen here, very simple. We're just clearing the entire, entire map data, bitmap data, basically, the patterns. Um, so it's very straightforward. And read joystick, I'm not going to go into it again. Um, same with the screen functions and the palette functions. I've covered it all before in YQuest and in the simple series. So if you need help on that, please take a look. So anyway, um, there we go. Um, yeah, it, it went relatively well. I mean, it, it took a few hours to convert all of the code. A lot of searching and replacing, really. As I say, the macros I've got are hopefully um, perfectly emulating the Z80 commands for the missing ones on the GVZ80. Now, um, in some cases in this one, actually, they weren't good enough, like the um, subtract and carry command, the ESBC HLDE type commands. Um, I'd got them, but they didn't actually use the carry before, and that was fine for my old code, which didn't really use the carry, but this code did use the carry. I had to rewrite them and make them better, which is, um, you know, it's always an improving and learning experience, this kind of thing. And so I did make a few changes to get the code working. Anyway, if you've liked this, you know, please uh, like and subscribe because that helps out with my motivation, if nothing else. And also YouTube recommends videos based on likes, so it helps out with that as well. But um, also, of course, please go to the website and download the source code and have a go at it yourself. And as I always say, if um, you find it's any use to you and um, you want to use it in your own project, even if they're commercial, go ahead and do it. I don't care. I uh, hope you have fun with it. Um, anyway, whatever you do, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job. And it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue Justify doing it, essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon one. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you'd like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.